Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Fran Kelly. And tonight we focus on the aged care crisis with aged services industry representative Sean Rooney, Sarah Holland-Batt, who gave evidence on the abuse and neglect of a father to the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety, the Minister for Aged Care, Richard Colbeck, Shadow Minister for Ageing, Julie Collins, and celebrity cook, Maggie Beer, who's campaigning for better food in our aged care facilities. Could you please welcome our panel? Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iview and News Radio. The Royal Commission into Aged Care was sparked by a series of ABC investigations into abuse and neglect. Many of us will end up in aged care one day and almost everybody has a close family member who's already in care. Our first question tonight comes from geriatrician Joseph Ibrahim. Thanks, Fran. Many people would rather die early than enter a nursing home. Do you share their fears? And what will our government and parliament do to change the situation so that aged care isn't a fate worse than death? I'll come to the Minister in a moment, but Maggie, let's go to the do you share their fears issue of that. Yes, I, I can see that that is the perception and the reality in lots of places, but we can change it because, and we must, because there are a percentage of people that will always need to go into it. So the perception is there uh, that people would rather not ever go into aged care, but we have to work on the positive and, and just say it can be changed. I know it can. That's exactly right. And Sarah, I suppose you've, your father is in aged care. I'm sure it wasn't an easy decision. That's something my dad always used to say to me, that he'd rather die before he went into aged care. I'm sure everyone in this room has heard someone say that. Um, but the sad reality is that sometimes uh, you're just dealt an unlucky hand and you have to go in. Um, and the situation at the moment for people who are in there is so um, variable and uneven in quality that we really do have places where you would, you would actually prefer to be dead than be um, experiencing the kind of negligence and neglect that goes on. Of course, there are good facilities, but... Yes. Um, I, I sort of share the view um, of the Commissioner um, that it is a national disgrace at present um, and that there need to be really serious systemic changes um, to address the quality of life for people in aged care. Richard Colbeck, what can the government do and what will the government do and the Parliament, I'll come to Julie Collins too, to change it, to do something about this? Well, I, I wouldn't share that view across the board, a bit like Sarah. I think there are obviously some facilities that... Um, probably shouldn't be in the system anymore and we, that, that need to improve the care that they're providing. Uh, but not all facilities are like that. But we need to continue to reform the system, uh, as we have done over uh, recent years, it, but it needs to be a process of continuous reform because the reality is that 8 to 10% of people will need residential aged care. Uh, and we don't want people to be in a situation where they fear it in the way that... Um, has just been described by Joseph. So we need to make sure, uh, as we've done with the new standards that we put in place from the 1st of July, that it's resident-focused, resident-facing, uh, and that the quality of care uh, and the standard of care uh, is what's expected by people. Um, and we, we, will, we can't have them fearing it. We will come to the issues tonight. We've had literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions sent in tonight. There's a lot of interest in this and a lot of ideas and a lot of particular themes and concerns that come up. But Julie Collins, what should the Parliament be doing? Are the reforms the Minister talked about there, are they a good start? Is it actually changing anything? Well, we have a lot of reports with recommendations about things that can be fixed pretty quickly in terms of the aged care system and we need to do some of those and I think that, you know, the government needs to start moving faster with some of that reform. Um, but I understand why people feel that way. When the stories come out and you see what has happened in the Royal Commission and some of the evidence that we've heard, you know, having had a family member in the aged care system, like many people, you understand why people feel that way. Um, but I've had the privilege of visiting many uh, residential aged care facilities around Australia and some of them are doing wonderful things and, and with great in innovation. But there's also some amazing staff out there really holding the system together <laughs> who are doing an incredible job, who are very stressed 
by not having enough resources to be able to do their job, uh, who are very stressed about not being able to provide the care they want to provide to people. OK, we're going to go to this, but just before we do, and Maggie, I can see you dying to jump in, <laughs> but let me ask Sean, because, yes. Sean, this is the sector you represent. Uh, the Minister's already said there are some there that shouldn't be there. Why are they still there? And if there are some good ones, why isn't everyone a good one, if we know how to do it well? Yeah, look, uh, th thanks for the question, Joe. And I think um, th there's undoubtedly been failures in the aged care system and they're unacceptable and uh, certainly uh, uh, something that we know is a system we need to do better and I'm uh, sorry that these things are, have happened. Um, I think what's going on in Australia's aged care system is the settings around policy, regulation, funding, workforce training, etc. They have not kept pace with the needs or the expectations of older Australians. And, and it's been mentioned by other panellists, there's been any number of inquiries and reviews and reform recommendations. But uh, unfortunately, we just haven't been able, as a system, to be able to embrace and adapt and adopt those. And, and part of it, as uh, we've said, or Julie has said, there are extremely, um, any number of uh, great examples of people that work very, very hard in our sector and the organisations that employ them do a good job in meeting the needs and expectations of older people they care for. Uh, but we know we need to do better and our sector is okay. committed to doing that. And we are, we, we are going to come to that. It set us up for the next question. But, Maggie, I can see you champing at the bit there. Yes. Just... <laughs> we do have some great um, organisations and we should be shouting from the rooftop about them and using them as benchmarks. And we have so many people working so hard with all of their heart but without time or permission often to do a job as well as they can do. That's what we have to change too. And on that very point, our next question comes from Gabby Pearson. Hello. <clears throat> a recent report by the Nurses and Midwives Association found 94% of aged care workers in New South Wales had transferred a resident to hospital following a fall in the past year, putting an additional burden of around 3 million on the state's already struggling public hospitals. 75% of those same aged care workers said that falls could have been avoided if there were better staff ratios in their facilities. Minister, when will the government stop pandering to the profiteering aged care companies and introduce mandated staff to residence ratios? <laughs> And Minister, I should tell you, Gabby is from the nurses, New South Wales Nurses and Midwives Association. I should also say we had literally a, probably 100 questions from uh, nurses, RNs, or people working in the system making the same point. Ratios. When are we going to get to it? Why not? Well, I understand that that seems to be a simple way to look at trying to change the way that the system works. But it's not necessarily on the evidence that we have what's the, the thing that's going to provide the answer. Uh, what is that evidence? For, what would be wrong with it? Well, there is no evidence to suggest specifically that just ratios are going to make all the difference. No. Uh, and so we don't support that. But what we've done in the new residential aged care standards that we introduced and I mentioned before on the 1st of July is, is a requirement to provide the level of care uh, that's required, uh, including clinical care, which is one of the issues that comes up as a part of this process, particularly around nurses, uh, that provides uh, an effective, uh, high quality level of care across the sector. So we don't support uh, ratios. There's a, there are variabilities between facilities based on uh, the needs of the residents in each of the facilities. So a simple uh, and blunt instrument like um, providing ratios within the facilities isn't necessarily, across the board, isn't necessarily something that's going to be, uh, in my view, sustainable, uh, but it isn't necessarily, on the evidence that I've seen, going to provide the answer towards providing care. All right. A blunt instrument, <coughs> Sean? Uh, th thank you so much for your question and thank you for your service for, for you and the other RNs and all the other people that work in our sector. Um, look, good quality staff with the right skills and the right training are fundamental to good care. Mm. Uh, every provider I meet, whether it's an RN, a facility manager, a care manager, I haven't met one that hasn't said to me, we don't want more staff, we don't want them better skilled and we don't want them better remunerated. Mm. So there's something to, to say we know we need more staff. Now, a mandated staff ratio is one way to achieve that outcome. Uh, 
but it's not universally supported. Now, we know the Workforce Task Force uh, did a strategy last year. We know the AMA and the ANMF have come out and recommended this. Uh, what the strategy recommended and what the AMA have recommended is to conduct research for optimum staffing models for the Australian system across all the different models of care. And that's a piece of work that we're currently doing and we'll be looking forward to, to working with uh, the AMF and others when we can share that because we've got to get this right. It's fundamental that, to get it right. if that piece of work comes back and says, yes, you need mandated ratios and you need, for instance, a registered RN 24 mm -hmm. hours a day, which I think is what the AMA and the nurses recently came up with, Will you then support ratios? Well, I think it would have to. I mean, but the outcome we want here is good quality care for older Australians. Yep. And, and if that's the best way to realise that outcome, then that's what we should be doing. Sarah? Can I just say, you know, on that topic of the blunt instrument, of ratios being a blunt instrument, another synonym for blunt instrument is bare minimum. We're talking about a bare minimum number of staff here. Um, and as someone who's, whose parent um, has suffered repeatedly from lack of staffing, that, that's... Of course, Dad's, Dad broke his hip. He broke six ribs from falling. Both of those incidents were because no one was there to help him, and so he had to help himself and tried to get himself around. When you have been, um, with respect, on the on the receiving end of those kinds of injuries, um, the first thing that comes to mind is how can we get a bare minimum number of staff? And I frankly think the fact that there's not an RN on site in aged care facilities in Australia 24 hours a day is is outrageous. These are people with complex needs. Just to your point, it won't solve every problem or it's a blunt instrument. I mean, do you think it's acceptable to not have an RN on staff? There might well, be 50 patients, 100 patients, no RN? Well, it depends on the care needs of the residents. I think that's the critical point. Yes, but there will always so, be a mix, won't it? And it will well, always it, change. It, it will always be a mix, mix and it will always ne uh, need to... And there will, it will always, always be high-care residents. Uh, and what the standard says is that the facilities need to have the appropriate staff on site at all What's times, the appropriate number of staff well, for that, 50 people in a that, ward? That, that's, that's, that's a matter for the facility, facility to determine. They need to have an appropriate level of staffing on site at all times to provide the appropriate care for the residents. Okay. That's what the standard says and that's what they're assessed against. Julie Collins, what's Labor's position? Because you haven't come down for ratios either, have you? Well, what we've said is we believe there needs to be more staff, they need to be better trained and better paid. We've been very clear about that. We've also said that we think there should be a nurse on 24 hours a day on site because I think there's a community expectation, as Sarah has said, that when something goes wrong, particularly in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. that there will be a nurse there to help your loved one. That is people's expectations and the community's expectations, and I think that we can deal with that. But the workforce issue is a really serious one because the Workforce Task Force does make 14 actions of government, and one of those is about a minimum qualification of a Cert 3, Certificate 3 for aged care. I am very concerned that uh, some of the staff don't get enough training and enough support in aged care to do their job. They want to do it really, really well and they're working so hard to do the best possible job but they don't have the training they need to do their work in every situation. Maggie, I'm going to leave you there for a minute because I'd like to do a fact check here if I can with maybe use Joseph there as a fact checker. Joseph, you've been in this industry a long time. You're a geriatrician. What's your response to what you've heard here in terms of from our politicians and the people uh, representing the sector? So I think ratios is a simplistic approach to a complicated problem. We need a bare minimum of staff is, is no question of that. It's not just more nursing staff. We don't have enough physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech pathologists, psychologists, mental health. And you need to have a staff ratio that matches the mix of residents that you're looking after. There's no point having a whole lot of nurses if you need, uh, if the residents need uh, allied health support. Yeah. What we don't have is enough staff to start with. Mm -hmm. If we accept that ratios are the answer, then that will not solve the problem in the future. I think the important thing is everyone's been talking about the football. Both teams have the same number of players. How well they work together is how well our facility runs. It's not just about numbers. And I think we, get, we become delusional if we think numbers is the answer. But I think Julie's right. If we don't have a minimum to start with, but we've got to be able to think through what are the needs of the residents, what are the professional groups that are needed and how, we, how do we deliver that. And the government missed an opportunity over 10 years ago when we trained more doctors and nurses instead of training people with the skill sets that are needed for the future. Yeah. And we continue to go back to old ways of doing things. 
and it's the old ways of doing things that have led us to the problem that we've got today. Okay, let's go to um, the next question, which is a video from Isabel Fisher in Banksia Park, South Australia. I'm a 17-year-old HK worker currently studying at high school. I have seen half a hamburger patty served to residents for their main evening meal, but it is somehow acceptable for aged care facilities to spend $6 per resident on food and beverages each day. To the panellists, I ask whether you think this standard of care would be acceptable for your mother or father. I also ask whether you think there should be government regulations that force facilities to improve meal qualities that will also improve residents' quality of life. Thank you. Thanks, Isabel. Maggie, that one's got your name yes. all over it. <laughs> it certainly <laughs> has. Itchy. But everything to me comes to culture, leadership, training, um, and it's a very complex arena uh, and it's so highly specialised for food. Cooks and chefs, there's nowhere in Australia that has uh, a proper education um, for the cooks and chefs who are dealing with much more difficult issues than um, being a cook in a restaurant. So the training needs are huge. Um, and there are new ways. There are better ways and there are new ways. And we, we know through our masterclasses we've been doing for nearly, uh, well, for four years, nearly five, that we can turn... Uh, around the cook and the chef to be a champion with knowledge if we have a CEO as the other champion and then you can start to change a culture. But not without a great deal of work and money. Uh, money is essential to increase. $6 a day is absolutely... It can't happen. You cannot get proper food. Can I ask you about that? You've been going into nursing homes over the last yes. few years and having a good look no. at this. Is $6 a day, Isabel mentioned it, I know you've talked about this before, $6 or $7 a day, is that what nursing homes are working on and what sort of food are you seeing served up to people? Right. What is making you so worried? Well, I guess we have had 200 cooks and chefs go through our training program and we have seen their budgets from as low as four fifty dollars a day to $15 a day. Um, and yet it's not just money that will make the difference. And what worries me is you cannot do real food with the scent of home cooking. Even if you're cooking for 100 people, you need the scents because we need our saliva to be increased because as we age, we uh, lose less, uh, lose more of it. And, and the scent of food is what gives you the cues to eat and helps the pleasure of eating. And... At six or seven dollars a day, you can only have processed foods and and frozen foods, um, and so it, it's it's impossible to give the quality of life, the well, um, the the quality of life that we must give to our people in aged care homes and in society. By the way, let's um, I'm going to let's continue this discussion about no. the food because I know there's a lot of interest, but we do have a follow up question from Ian Pulsus, who's the New South Wales manager of Leading Age Services Australia. That's the peak body that Sean is uh, in charge of. Um, Maggie, since nearly half of Australian care homes are running at a loss, what services are you willing to see reduced in order to pay for more expensive meals? Mm. <laughs> it's a very difficult question. Because everything ultimately everything comes, comes down to, to dollars money. and numbers of people. Okay. <laughs> but for me, this new way of thinking that we need, we need to step back and see what we can do being simple and bringing in the reality of... of with knowledge, you can do really beautiful food where everything else is right for about $10.50 a day. So from $7 to $10.50 is going to make what percentage difference? And when you have, when you have beautiful food, you don't have the need for pharmaceutical supplements. You have a positive workforce because they're proud. So what we do is spend money differently um, and raise the bar. OK. Sean, $10.50 a day is what Maggie says is required to provide something that is going to be good for you, basically. Is that doable? And do you accept that you could spend that extra $3 there and that would relieve you of the need of some other sort of yeah, care? Yeah, I, I think um, what Maggie will tell you, a, a flavour, aroma, uh, nutrition, all of that wrapped up in a dining experience is, is what we would all desire. And, and 
being able to do that well in an aged care setting is challenging, and, and, uh, and certainly Maggie understands some of those challenges. Uh, but, but notwithstanding that, uh, I think Maggie's on to the, 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 the thing here, that getting that right has a whole range of other benefits yes. for the residents yes. in, in emotional, social, psychological, all of these types of things. So potentially you will be able to actually realise some, some economy in that. But, but to be honest, I think it's a bit of a false economy to say that somehow we're going to have to trade off a meal to um, you know, a physiotherapist session or, or something like that. I mean, at the end of the day, we want the system that meets the needs of older Australians that require that support. That this is what the country is screaming out for and this is, what, this is why this conversation is so important. Sarah, what was the experience for your dad in the nursing home in terms of food? Um, it's his, his, the food in his home is actually fine, but you know, when you actually look at the news stories and the stories coming out of the Commission about the food, you do see some really, really grim realities. So for my dad, the food has not been the problem. The staffing, the chronic understaffing has been the issue. There is a connection from some of the questions we've had and the point um, that Joseph was making too in terms of numbers of staff, Minister, because a lot of the, the questions came in and said, well, you know, food is the food is often designed around what's easy to serve and that's why party pies are served up because you can just lump it on the plate and people don't need help eating it so much or that the food is just served and left out of the range of people and they can't get to it and that's a problem. So again, it's coming back to staff numbers. Well, the, the leaving food out of range really would be, in, in my view, a complete breach of the regulations and the new standards that we've just put in place and I think Maggie's point that she made earlier about transferring knowledge between the really good facilities and those yes. that aren't so good is one of the really, really valuable things that yeah. we can do. We're doing it in other areas uh, and I'd commend her for the work that she's been doing over a number of years now uh, around teaching uh, chefs, cooks within aged care facilities to, um, to provide a high quality product uh, because as she quite rightly says, a good food is a really important part of the overall provision of care. It's a really important part of that. Uh, and, as she, and again, as she correctly says, it actually can also help to mitigate uh, some of the other issues. And when she was talking about aromas and smells, I mean, I, uh, I related to that immediately because that is part of the food experience. Okay, so but if we know so this... transferring that knowledge, which is what the government's doing, working with Maggie to do, is a really important part of this so that the good practice can be transferred across the, the rest of the sector so that they can put those sorts of things in place as well. I was looking at the books of a facility on, uh, on Saturday and they were spending about $12 <coughs> on their meals. So it, it's something that I take an interest in. I was looking at the figures that they were uh, talking to me about. But transferring that knowledge across the sector, I think, is, is one of the things that, ways that we can continue to improve it. Just to finish on this, Maggie, your experience in terms of the transfer, how much <coughs> eagerness and enthusiasm is there from the institutions to there, learn. There is a huge eagerness. Everyone wants to do better, but a lot are struggling with the how, and that's that lack of education, that lack of very specific training that is needed. Um, and that can... It turns people around and it makes them the most excited champions ever and it has the food is the center of the plate but everything else comes around it it's not just the food uh, but the the food is complicated um, and in terms of having to look after vulnerable people and and um, uh, those with dysphagia you know and that training just isn't happening unless we're doing it and and there are a lot of other people doing wonderful things right. and there needs to be a conduit. We try and be a conduit as the foundation for sharing good information, science that's up to date, tips, things to empower the cooks and chefs because give them the respect, the kudos that they deserve. They can do more than anyone else to make a difference. Uh, and often they're not respected in their own arenas, let alone in the wider world of food. And they are the ones that can really make the difference. And Frank, with I've knowledge. had a number, of, a number of other people come to me talking to me about exactly what Maggie's yeah. been talking about, uh, that uh, have expertise in food, uh, who want to, tra to use that knowledge and transfer it into the industry. Uh, and, in fact, I had an email just yesterday about it. OK, so. well, it looks like one of those things, at least the regulators are going to need to make sure that everyone is learning it, everyone is subscribing yes. to yeah. the online standards and all of that. Remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter and keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. Our next question comes from Judy Muir. Hi. 
There are over 50% of residents in aged care facilities that suffer from dementia. Many of these residents exhibit perceived challenging behaviours because their needs are not being met. And unfortunately, these behaviours are controlled at the moment too often by chemical and physical restraints. How do you suggest that we resource the aged care sector so that the people with dementia receive not only adequate personal care, but quality care that ensures their individual needs are met? Now, this is a huge issue because something like 52% of people living in our aged care facilities have dementia. Um, Sarah, let me start with you because I think your dad has, mm -hmm. and this is quite a common thing, mm -hmm. developed dementia during his time in the home. Was there, did you get a sense that that was recognised, anticipated and the support and the training is there? No, absolutely not. And I think the issue is that the pre predominantly care is being delivered by personal care workers who can have as little as a five-week TAFE certificate um, to undertake, undertake the caring. And so mm -hmm. these are not people who have medical expertise. They don't really understand. Um, and I've had people say to me, Dad's carers say to me, oh, well, the trouble with your dad is he just doesn't retain instructions. And I sort of oh. say to them, I'm sorry, um, oh. he has dementia he has cognitive decline in Parkinson's and so that kind of fundamental ignorance um, of what what's required is really alarming and so that is why of course I'm 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 in support of more medical knowledge in these places, that in that skill mix that's required in the aged care sector, I think there is such a dearth of people who genuinely um, understand these conditions and know how to care for them properly. But I think we need to train everybody in the system, from yeah. the cooks and the chefs to the gardeners to the personal care Absolutely. workers, everybody yeah. along the whole system that that person comes into contact with needs to understand dementia and we need to do more in the community to get other people to understand dementia so that people understand the behaviours and how to respond to encourage people with dementia to continue living in their community for as long as possible but when it's not possible that they're getting the best possible care I was absolutely shocked when I read the numbers of people being chemically restrained in nursing homes. Um, I've read a lot of the transcripts of the Royal Commission and I was gobsmacked. I couldn't believe it. And, you know, the government has since um, put some regulation in around that. But what that's doing is measuring the number of people being chemically restrained. It's not actually reducing the number of people being chemically restrained. So I think we've got a lot more work to do yet. Um, and clearly, uh, some of this medication also is not really very effective for treating people with dementia either. Uh, all it's doing is essentially putting people in a princess chair all day, drugged up, which means that the carers have to deal with them less, and that's not OK. Mary, and I've been into some facilities and seen that. Let me ask Murray McCabe, who's the CEO of Dementia Australia, in the audience tonight. Murray, the, uh, in the, the numbers of people being physically and chemically restrained, I think we've all been shocked to hear these stories in the Royal Commission, the government has brought in regulations that are guidelines. Has anything changed? And is there a better way of managing so that we won't need this kind of restraining? Absolutely, Fran. And I think some things have changed. One of the challenges, we know the research shows us that antipsychotic medication, which is often used for restraining people living with dementia, is ineffective in 80% of cases. It increases the risk of heart attack, of stroke and of death. In 20% of cases, it is effective, but people unfortunately are unaware of other interventions that are supportive of people and the challenges that they face when their responses are interpreted as being aggressive or inappropriate. Sean Rooney, if as Marie gave us that statistic, uh, in 80% of the cases, the chemical restraint is ineffective for the people. Why are the institutions using it? Do yes. they not know this? Well, I mean, that there is no medication that is administered at an aged care facility that isn't prescribed by a general practitioner. So, so there is a, the starting point here. This is an integration issue for a primary care or general practice, acute care hospitals and aged care. So, and, and that's writ large in a lot of the, uh, the issues coming out of the Royal Commission. And I know indeed with Sarah's uh, father, that was an issue. Uh, I think that the point to note with respect to, um, to, to Marie is that uh, we've, uh, industry has argued for mandatory uh, training for all care workers. Th th this is fundamental. One of the things that yes. we've been doing with one of our members is uh, we brought to Australia the Virtual Dementia, Dementia Tour, which is actually an experiential training tool for we want to see every aged care worker trained to actually feel and sense and experience what it is like to have dementia. Because when they go through that process, they have so much more empathy and understanding for the condition and the people they're caring for. And then there's lots of other things. So micro towns and dementia villages, there's lots of innovation 
in, model, in, in models of care. But uh, I think Marie would also tell you this is not just an issue for aged care. No. This is an issue for the nation. Yeah. Uh, because we know that it's such an insidious, debilitating uh, condition that will rob people of, of their memory, of their confidence, of their identity and, and of their dignity. And this is something that as a community and a society we need to be able to, to do better. And we've seen, we see this already and it's already talked of in terms of an epidemic mm -hmm. in Britain and we're using the same sort of language here. Minister, are you getting the feeling we're talking about we, in, we need more training of the carers, we need more people involved, it might not be ratios, but the numbers, as Joe said, we need more people generally. We need more money per head spent on meals. Are you getting the feeling that you're going to need to put a lot more money in here to aged care? Well, it's clear, it's, it's clear that the industry is under pressure, the whole sector is under pressure, and uh, the numbers confirm that, and Sean and I and Julie have had a number of conversations around that. Mm -hmm. But in the context of dementia, I, I agree that the entire aged care workforce needs an uplift. Um, the broader community needs better understanding of dementia, and I think that comment's true. The medical profession needs to understand it better. I've done the experience that yeah. uh, Marie's got at uh, Dementia Australia, and um, it's quite confronting. It is indeed. Uh, yeah, Frank, can I just say, I mean, if we want a world-class aged care system, it's going to require world-class funding. Yeah. So yeah. when the Minister says an uplift... So, so, yeah. Yeah. What sort of numbers are we well, well, talking so, about? So currently we spend less than 1% of GDP on aged care. The OECD average is 1.5%. So surely that's telling us that we're behind the eight ball. We know there's 50% of residential care facilities are currently operating at a loss. Yeah. That this is not a sustainable, viable system as it currently stands and we need to come up with a solution right now. So, again, what sort of figure? Are you anticipating? I mean, so, so, I imagine, uh, and I could be put, putting words into the Minister's mouth, that at some point he'll say, well, we'll wait to the Aged Care uh, Royal Commission. But a lot of people have made the point we've had 20 inquiries, we basically know the issues. Yeah, and, Fran, we can't wait. Uh, the Minister knows. We've said $1.3 billion is required over the next 18 months. $1.3 billion? To, in addition to what's currently uh, in the budget, in order to maintain uh, standards up until we get a, a, an outcome from the Royal Commission. Now, that's just in residential aged care. That doesn't deal with the 120,000 people looking for support in their homes on the home. We're care. getting to them. Joseph? I just want to be clear that the issue about physical and chemical restraints being known for over 10 years, being involved with both, both parties, Parliament's known about it, medical staff have known about it, and nothing has changed. And so to say that we're dealing with it as a new problem is wrong. It's been there for a long time. And so the problems that allow it to have existed remain in the lack of leadership in terms of the whole country on that topic. And stating a law that says that we should not restrain people, I think, was really not very helpful because people know you're not meant to restrain or shackle. So simply saying it's now illegal is not a help. The help that's needed is to get to the root cause of why it occurs. Mm. And we lack respect for older people. We lack bipartisan approaches to yeah. it. And the Parliament's generally been gutless mm. about addressing aged care issues for the last 10 to 15 years. Can I just say on yeah. that, Fran? <laughs> the, the Living Longer, Living Better reforms in 2013 were bipartisan and we have spoken to the government over the last three or four years about bipartisanship in terms of long-term reform. Uh, we are up for the conversation of long-term reform of aged care because we do have to get it right. But we also need to act soon. Labor is not in government. You know, Richard is the minister here. Um, we need leadership to change this and change it quickly. The problem we have had in my view, is that we've had six years and four ministers and they're taking time to get across their brief, which you understand, but what it's done is it's delayed the reform that is necessary and we need to act faster. J just hang on, uh, hang on, Maggie. Well, just, just to respond. Oh, you will get to respond, trust Good. me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to bring food into dementia. Uh, you mentioned unmet needs and an aggression that can happen because someone is agitated. We have examples of homes that have cottages where there are a carer and 10 or 12 people in a cottage and they actually cook with the carer. They go shopping. They're not confined by four walls where they can't open a door. We have to look what's happening there and food can help um, stave off cognitive 
decline as well. The right food, the Mediterranean diet, the, the, the huge amount of protein and, mm -hmm. and dairy and all the things that we need. So food and dementia should be linked together as one of the paths to help. And the way we design our institutions probably too can yes. help. But, Minister, yes, you can yeah, look, have a word. I, I just <laughs> want to dispel this perception that we're not doing anything because uh, I've made a very conscious decision not to pause any of the changes that my predecessor put into place. Uh, so we started uh, acting particularly on the Patterson, uh, Carnell Patterson reviews uh, last year. Uh, a new Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner started on the 1st of January this year. New Aged Care Res uh, residential standards came into place on the 1st of July this year. Uh, and they are very much more resident focused. It's about the resident effectively looking through the facilities to the resident and they're the focus of the new standards. Uh, the new uh, residence charter, which came into place on the 1st of July as well, and of course the new regulations around restraint, which I think uh, are not... Okay. So, uh, which, so, so there are a range of things that we're, we're continuing change. to do uh, as, as, as the Royal Commission continues, and we will continue. There's another tranche of legislation... But I started this asking issue. about funding, and we just heard Sean say £1.3 is needed within the next 18 months. Mm -hmm. We know the government is about to come up with some kind of additional drought response because mm -hmm. action is needed now. Will you go and say we definitely need £1.3 We can't wait for the Royal Commission. Uh, we are we are looking at all of the reports and the numbers right now. Uh, I, I can't come on here and make a commitment to something that hasn't been decided by government. That, no, no, that, I said that, will, you that go would be the right thing. To an, an uh, but I, I've I am very cognisant of the circumstance of the industry right now. Uh, the comment that Sean also made around res uh, home care places, very alert to the, the okay. timing around that. So it's it's not something that we're not uh, considering. We're not cognisant of. Uh, we are very, very aware of the circumstances oh. of the industry. Let's go now to all those people who are hoping to not go into an aged care facility. Our next question is from Anita Calcutt. Thanks, Fran. Many elderly people wish to remain in their homes and have services delivered to them. Why can't the funding of <coughs> home care packages be like the childcare funding and be available as soon as the ACAD assessment's been completed? Yeah. Waiting times for the higher packages are in excess of 12 months, yeah. so people actually die waiting. Mm -hmm. Carers months. are burnt out or the government goes into full-time residential care because they can't get the, the home care packages. Yeah. Now, that seemed like a really sensible suggestion to me. We know what happens in childcare. People get their subsidies straight away. The positions are there. Why can't it happen? Good question, Fran. And I guess that the point is... is you know, question, Anita. What actually. do we... Anita, <laughs> yes, Anita. <laughs> Um, I get 91-year-olds uh, contacting my office who are a carer of a loved one who are blind and they're saying we're being told we have to wait two years for a home care package. In Australia today, I don't think that's acceptable. Um, I think we need to do better. I've raised with the Minister personally some of my ideas about how to deal with the national um, prioritisation queue. I think there's some issues around that. Um, I think that we should be giving people in their 90s some sort of priority or people with terminal illnesses who have less than three or six months to live who are being told you have to wait two years. It's just not acceptable today and we can and should do better. Um, I'm going to come to the Minister because it is about dollars again to some degree and a model, but Sean, you represent those who also uh, provide home services. I mean, wh is it just about resources? Why are people assessed and then left? Uh, good question, uh, Anita, and, and to follow it too, Fran. Look, we, we have a situation where uh, we've had a policy in place since 2012. Uh, one of the key objectives of that policy is to realise support for older Australians to age in their homes. There are 90,000 funded packages that are fully subscribed. There are 120,000 people who have been assessed as requiring care in their homes but are unable to access that care either at their uh, assess, at assessed level or at all. Now, for seven years, we've been working on trying to get a program in place to support people to age in place, and we are failing. So what's and the And it's, we, we, it's because we have capped the number of places and they are being slow to be released. We've put forward to government that there should be a 90-day maximum waiting period. From the time you are assessed to the time you receive care and services should be no longer than 90 days. And how much would that cost? Uh, We've costed that out to say if we were to reduce that 120,000 uh, wait list over to something more manageable that came down to that 90 days, it would probably take two to three years, and we think that's half a billion dollars a year additional. Richard, Richard Colbeck, what do you think about the notion of uncapping? And what do you think about Anita's point about 
modelling it on the childcare model? Well, we, we obviously need to continue to reduce the waiting lists. Um, Quickly. I'm, I'm a bit more ambitious than, than Sean. I think 30 to 60 days is probably a reasonable time frame. Um, but now currently people are waiting a year or two. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a, a little bit jaundiced about Julie's claim, given that um, uh, they didn't put an extra dollar in for home care packages at the election campaign, not an extra dollar from... You didn't either. Uh, from the Labor That's Party. A bit blunt about uh, that. But we put 25,000 additional packages into the system last year, which was an increase of 25%. Uh, so f since last year's budget, we put $2.2 billion into additional. Okay, but it's still uh, not resident. enough, clearly. No, so what's no, the and, answer? And we're still not there yet. I, I agree with Sean around the model. I, I've got some concerns around the structure of the model, and I think that we can. Uh, activate a lot of money that's locked up within the system yeah. that's not being utilised at the moment. So uh, I'm actively looking at that at the moment and not necessarily like a childcare set, a situation but the model that we use for NDIS, I have to say, has more attraction to me but we're still working our way through that process. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to continue to require additional resources and on the current projections, we're at 125,000 packages. We'll go to 157 by 22, 23. But we've got 128,000 people waiting. Yes, exactly. but, but not all of those are not receiving care. 95% of those are receiving care at some level, uh, may be lower than what they are, but 95% of them are either, either receiving a package at a lower level or re receiving care through community home care, uh, a CHSP package. So uh, it's not that they're not receiving any care at all, they're receiving some care but not necessarily at the level that they've been assessed, Sarah? which is the issue we've got to deal with. I think um, something that's just being lost in this discussion about funding is the transparency about where exactly it's going. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we are hearing... Some, this, year, this year, I suppose, roughly, we'll be spending $20 billion on aged care funding, which is a lot of money when you consider there are around 200,000 people in residential care and then people with home care packages. We know that home care packages are being rorted. We know that people are using that money um, for administ exorbitant administration fees. We also know that with um, aged care funding, with residential aged care funding, that yes, some providers are struggling, but other providers um, are paying out gigantic dividends and making huge profits for their shareholders when they're primarily being funded with um, Commonwealth Government funding. So I really think that in order to um, be given these checks for more, for more taxpayer funds, we need radical transparency about where this where this yeah. money's going. Yeah. Yeah. Our next question is from Shirley McLaren. Oh, hello. I'm Shirley and I'm 87. In, in 1951, when the Korean War broke out, I was selected to join the Women's Royal Australian Air Force and I served for four and a half years. Recently, I was on old the ABC program, Old People's Homes for Four-Year-Olds. <laughs> Thank you. So I know firsthand how beneficial these intergenerational activities can be. Richard Colbeck and Julie Collins, if intergenerational activities can help delay the onset of dementia and help reduce the severity of dementia symptoms, then what plans does the government have to fund intergenerational activities in the future. Thank you very much, Julie. And I'm pretty sure everyone's going to, have, yes. going to want to have a go at this, but let's start with the two politicians on the panel. So, Julie? Well, thank you, Shirley, and it was a wonderful program, and I've seen many similar programs uh, with intergenerational uh, at many facilities that I have visited. Um, there are a number of um, facilities in my own electorate where they have school children come in on a regular basis and do intergenerational work. And it's wonderful, I think, and very rewarding for everybody. And I think it's a terrific, terrific thing. Um, whether it costs additional money or not, I don't know what the cost may or may not be. But certainly I think it's a very worthwhile activity. And every time I see it, it warms my heart in every facility. And it's wonderful that you're able to participate. It's terrific. <laughs> 
Maggie? Well, it's... Does it cost money or is it opening people's minds to the opportunity? Um, and, and that show and, and others on the ABC have done that and you've done it so brilliantly. And it just takes people looking at things differently. Mm -hmm. And we have... Uh, I went to the opening of a Montessori school in mm -hmm. South Australia two months ago in the middle of an aged care home. <laughs> Can you believe it? That's what we need. We need to encourage it, talk about it and show how great it is. Sean, does it cost money? Look, I th thank, thank you so much for your story. Thank you for the program. Thank you for your, your war service. Uh, it, it, it doesn't cost money. What it costs is time. Yeah. And uh, as a policy, are the providers interested? Oh, the, the, this is happening every day in, in yeah. aged care, right. and I think what we uh, what what the value of the program uh, that Shirley was involved in is it's actually opened the door inside an aged care facility and shown the value of this intergenerational mm. connectivity. And um, what we're seeing is new models of care emerging. So. Uh, Instead of having aged care homes or nursing homes behind high brick walls, you know, in, in leafy uh, streets, this is actually trying to create a space for the community that opens it up and allows um, intergenerational and, uh, I guess, community engagement and interaction. And, and that's part of the future. That's part of seeing things differently, yeah. as Maggie says. Richard Colwick, you're the Minister now. That program has had an enormous impact on people. I mean, people mention it to me all the time. It's wonderful. So has it changed the way you're thinking about things? Are you determined to sort of try and move this forward, this, or broaden this take-up of intergenerational... Well, like Julie, I've been into a number of facilities that have been doing this for a while. What this wonderful show that Shirley participated in, and again, thank you for your service, Shirley, uh, and thank you for your participation in the show, has opened people's minds and, uh, and thoughts to, the, to what is possible. Uh, and, and, and this is a, a, a great demonstration of that. It's, it's, it's given publicity to something that's been happening in facilities. I've uh, had a look at one in Hobart. They have the kids come in for 12 months. Yep. Uh, they came in a day a week for 12 months. Mm -hmm. So is it something you're going to try and, and drive and So I, I would encourage facilities to continue that sort of engagement. Uh, and I know that some facilities are looking to build childcare centres. In fact, I was one in Victoria only a couple of weeks ago. They're looking to build a childcare centre next door so that they can build that sort of engagement. I think that's fantastic. And if, if the ABC show has... Uh, opened up people's minds to that level of engagement and opportunity. It's a fantastic thing. Can I just ask Shirley, Shirley, just tell us a tiny little bit about what you got from it. Well, the interaction of the older adults with the four-year-olds was just absolutely superb. And I think that we learnt from the four-year-olds as what did much you as learn? the four-year-olds <laughs> learnt from us. What, what did you learn, though? What difference did it make to how people were feeling? Well, I think that the four-year-olds had a great deal of care and compassion mm. for the older um, people on the program, but also we had a different viewpoint on how to relate with four-year-olds, how to talk with four-year-olds, how to interact with four-year-olds, and it was a great benefit to both young and old. And, Sarah, just finally, did you have anything like this in your dad's nursing home or would it have made a difference, do you think? I think it would make a huge difference. There was nothing like that in dad's... In, there is nothing, nothing like that like in that. dad's nursing home. But I think what's underlying why that was so powerful for you and why it sounds so transformative is that the reality is most people are spending all of their days alone. Mm -hmm. yes. They're depressed, yeah. they're lonely, mm -hmm. they're bored. Um, sometimes they're just parked in front of the television and just sat there. You know, I think... The, the, and underlying all of this is just ageism. It's just yeah. this idea it that is. these people yeah. are... It is. Ageism. Yeah. That's, that's one of the things yeah. I think that it can actually change. Yeah. I, I think it's been mentioned a couple of times tonight, the attitudinal change that we require in our society around older Australians. Um, kids in fact, when, when I... And <laughs> kids don't discriminate. That's but right. I talk to Indigenous uh, communities and they talk about their elders. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that sort of thought process and culture around the way that we uh, engage with older Australians mm -hmm. is, is, a, is a real change in thinking that we need to uh, encourage and something like this can actually start that process because it will take time to build exactly. its way through the uh, community but this is a really great way to start. 40% it. of people in aged care homes have no visitors mm -hmm. so that loneliness mm -hmm. issue must be sure. an enormous one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, look, we will move on because there's so much to get through. Our next question is from Helen Williams. Uh, my parents' aged care facility failed two accreditation reviews. 
receiving a serious risk notification, and yet they are allowed to continue to operate. I've worked in aged care and witnessed the same issues in many facilities, and I believe the issues are systemic. With so much evidence that many provide substandard care, why is, why is immediate action not taken to protect the most vulnerable people in our society? Sean Rooney, why are there still places operating that have <coughs> all these complaints made against them? They fail the accreditation mm. all the time. They go after warning and warning and they're still open. Look, th thanks for the question, Helen, and, and thanks for the work you do in the sector. Um, I, I think we all need to have confidence in the aged care system, and that comes from good regulation and good performance and good behaviour. And how would you I, describe I, it currently? Well, I think what we're finding is we have a, a system that's in transformation where the regulator is learning how to do their job better, whilst the uh, aged care providers are doing their best to do their job better. Uh, getting back to the, the actual process of... Um, uh, I guess, assessment and accreditation. Uh, when, when a service uh, has a non-compliance, when they're not meeting the, the standards, uh, the, the best and uh, most appropriate outcome is to get that service back into compliance. That, that is the most appropriate way to deal with it. The problem we have, though, is that there can be uh, providers and services that are repeat offenders, and it is in nobody's interest to have repeat offenders in our sector because, firstly, they're putting at risk the people that they're caring for, but they're also damaging the reputation of all the other providers that do a good job. Yeah, and we've all seen recent reports of, for instance, one of the major providers, mm -hmm. um, Bupa. In fact, we've got a question here from Yumi Lee. Last year, Bupa in Australia <clears throat> and New Zealand posted a pre-tax profit of $585 million, while at the same time, 60% of its facilities are failing basic standards and 30% are putting the health and safety of its elderly at serious risk. Not okay. Can the panellists justify the profiteering of these companies on the backs and lives of our vulnerable elderly population and explain why it is that they are best placed to care for our elderly. Richard Colbeck, that's linked to the question earlier too mm. about the accreditation. I mean, why uh, is profiteering too strong a word and is it simply that we've got ourselves into a situation where some of these providers, and Bupa is one of them, are too big to fail? How do we deal with that and enforce standards? Look, I don't put uh, Bupa in the classification of too big to fail. I put them in the classification of big enough to, to conform. And that's what I expect that they should do. But they're not doing uh, they, it. They've they... got 72 homes and 45 have failed to meet health and safety standards. And, and that's why uh, my department is meeting with their management weekly. That's why we've required them to employ uh, uh, additional staff and particular management uh, nurse managers in their facilities, each of the facilities that are not, not conforming, uh, and in their um, uh, main office to bring them back to conformance. I expect that a, an organisation such as Bupa should be complying with the regulations. That's, that's their role. So uh, rather than being too big to fail, big enough to comply and to conform. And that's what I expect that they should be doing. Uh, and that's why... Uh, in a couple of circumstances where they've lost accreditation, they've actually had to provide services without getting any Commonwealth money. Um, so so their, uh, the Commonwealth fees get taken out when they l lose their accreditation. Uh, I expect them to come back to compliance. Uh, that's their responsibility. Uh, and uh, uh, there's no question about that. that. That is what we expect of providers in the system. Uh, and as I said earlier, if they're not going to uh, comply, we don't want to see them in the system, if they're not going to pro provide a service that's adequate. Sarah, let me ask you about your experience with your father, because you made complaints. Mm. Uh, what, what was your sense of how those complaints were treated and how the regulators responded to you when you went further? Regulator was useless, completely useless. Um, the regulator, uh, I found it through freedom of information documents that I got, that the regulator decided on my first phone call that Dad's case was suitable for early resolution. 
before they'd even done an investigation, before they'd even gone to the provider. Um, I get the sense that the regulator is very um, interested in having statistics like, oh, so many cases are resolved within 30 days, as though that means everything's been robustly investigated, wrapped up and everyone's happy. Um, that's not the case. So I, I had an appalling experience um, with the regulator. And on the, on the issue of accreditation, can I just say, Dad's facility passed all 44 standards of accreditation um, in both of the last reviews. Um, so the entire time he's lived there and lived through these horrors, uh, the facility has been fully accredited to the absolute maximum standard, which to me is just outrageous. And, and most people don't know your story, but just, just give us a small... Um, sample of the horrors? Well, th I think the, the very worst thing for me was a whistleblower came forward. Um, Dad's had a number of horrors there, medication mismanagement, all sorts of stuff, but a whistleblower came forward and told us that someone had been deliberately victimising and abusing Dad, let an infection get so bad that he had to be hospitalised, um, verbally abused him, told him that she was sick of his shit, left him in soiled incontinence pads for hours with the door closed. It was a horror show and that was the, that was the substance of my complaint to the then Aged Care Complaints Commissioner. Um, and that was suitable for early resolution on the first phone call. Uh, uh, Julie, I'll come to you in a moment, but Sean Rooney, isn't the reality that that complaint and that person who was known to have behaved like that could, if they were fired, and we don't even know if they were, could then get a job in another institution right. and there'd be no record of them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. You're right, Fran, and this is one of the shortcomings in the system, is that there is... Shortcoming? There, there, there is is that what not, we call that? that well, there, there is not a national database which we've advocated for and fully support for, for personal care workers, so we can actually track uh, their accreditation, their qualification and, and also their work history. Because at the moment, if you're employing somebody in, into the sector, you're relying on all the new, usual police checks and uh, referees, but if you don't have that, uh, I guess, professionalisation of the sector, uh, then uh, we, we can't be assured that these people aren't actually moving to, to other locations. And that's why it's fundamentally important to get that right. We keep hearing what's fundamentally important to get right. We know what they are. We've allegedly got the reforms in place, but we keep hearing these stories, Julie. And, and the stories are not acceptable. I mean, it comes back to the point that Sarah made earlier about transparency of funding and where does it go. Uh, I think that if we're going to talk about future funding of the aged care system, if we're going to talk about what is quality aged care and how we're going to pay for it, we have to have transparency on where the money goes. If it's taxpayer money, we need more transparency. But we also need transparency around the complaint system. And I said on the very first day when the legislation came through about combining the safety commissioner and the regulator, that I wasn't convinced that the new Safety Commissioner has enough powers to intervene and arbitrate early. And I think that the Commissioner needs more powers to intervene and arbitrate much earlier in any of the complaints that it is receiving. I mean, if your complaint at the very first phone call was requires early investigation and decision, then why didn't that happen? Okay. That is my question. It should be able to happen and they should be able to arbitrate and make a decision and rectify it quickly. The other thing, is for repeat offenders that continually breach accreditation, I think we need to consider some form of penalty. Criminal penalty? Yeah. Um, I think we need to consider some sort of penalty. Yeah. There are so many issues. There are so many burrows to go down. Maggie, I know you want to have a say, but we have only time for one last question, and I know you will want to have a say on this one. It's from Kate Radcliffe. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Um, firstly, I'd like to say, Maggie, I want to be you when I grow up. <laughs> right. So I'm really glad I got this last question. Um, Maggie, you represent a wonderful, caring, accomplished person in her senior years who is still doing what she loves and you always take an interest in everyone you encounter, which I'm sure we all agree and I, I really admire that. Uh, you're a recognisable role model for ageing well. Do you think we as a community need to make more of an effort to celebrate ageing so that we do not forget our elders nor subject them to substandard health care and, as a society, allow them the best quality of life in their final years? Absolutely. The <coughs> celebrating age is what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and what we should be doing is making sure we're all connected, that we're, we're doing something that we love and that we encourage everyone around us to do this. Um, and, um, and, and see the respect for those that have lived long lives and gone through so many things that, you know, have made this country what it is today. Um, and 
you know, there's got to be joy in life. There's got to be pleasure. And so, you know, I, I bring so much back to food where, you know, <laughs> nutrition is <laughs> not enough. All back to food. <laughs> <laughs> nutrition is not enough. Pleasure. Pleasure and, and the will to be engaged and be part of a community and multi-generational. And, you know, getting back to what we're talking about in this sector, professionalism. We have to raise these standards so everybody that is part of it um, has got to show that they know what they're doing and to be so registered. And, and look at every bit, good bit of information that is around. Look at uh, and utilise it and change your thinking and love life. Right. That's what we all should be doing. <laughs> On that note, that is all we have time for tonight. Could you please thank our panel, Sean Rooney, Sarah Hollenbach, Richard Colbeck, Julie Collins and Maggie Deer. And thank you, all of you, for your questions tonight and the hundreds of questions we've received in anticipation of this. It was um, really overwhelming, the interest in this. You can continue this discussion on Facebook and Twitter. Next week on Q&A, Hamish MacDonald will be in the chair with journalist, comedian and researcher at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, Vicky Shu, Ethics Centre CEO Simon Longstaff, the Financial Review's National Affairs columnist Jennifer Hewitt, Liberal MP Tim Wilson and Labor Shadow Minister Tim Watts. Until next Monday, good night.